will be recording on YouTube automatically. And then so um, we have um, people are still currently still registering. Um, but as of this morning, we had about 130 people registered for the event. Uh, we should have much more um, joining in last minute, as it, as it is the Portuguese way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, just making sure everything is okay. Okay, and I've been informed that we are live right now. Um, so we'll just wait um, two minutes more, and then we start. Hey, has Thomas already connected? So no, Thomas hasn't yet. Let me check. Um, he's he yet had to problems uh, receiving the mail. The, yeah, your ad the address we were using was uh, at some, a few typos in. Yes, exactly. So I, I resent it to him on LinkedIn, so he should be able to join in soon. Hi, Carol, welcome. You're on mute. Hi, Otis, glad to be here. Thank you for joining. Okay, so I'm guessing we can start now. So um, thank you everyone for joining this webinar, um, Improving the Investment Culture in Portugal. We are super excited to have everyone on board, all the panel speakers and the other speakers who will be discussing today about the Portuguese startup um, ecosystem. Um, so just to give you a rundown of um, the agenda, uh, we don't intend to spend more than, um, more than one hour, 20 minutes. Um, so we'll be um, as quick as possible. So obviously we would first have the welcome notes um, from um, Fabio, um, who is the head of um, external collaboration at EIT Digital, who will give us an introduction of what EIT Digital is, why they're interested in Portugal, and any other interesting information about EIT Digital. Then um, we would have the presentation of the reports, which is one of the reasons why we are here today. And just to give you some quick highlights, obviously you get an opportunity to download the reports after um, after the webinar um, is over. Then we'll move on to the panel's discussion. I'll try and wrap up with my presentation quickly on the highlights so we can have a lot of, um, we can get to the good stuff, which is the discussion with the amazing um, panel that we have right now. Yeah, so we will still give you time for you to introduce yourself later on. And then we'll open the, um, um, for Q&A and then we will close the session. So uh, I think Thomas joining us. So I'll pass the microphone, the virtual microphone to Fabio. Uh, to kick it off. Fabio, would you like to share your screen um, or would you just like to talk? I'm just going to talk and, uh, okay. and I don't want to steal too much time to the rest of the, of the uh, event. Just saying a few words, um, who we are. We are the largest uh, partnership about the digital, trying to help the local ecosystem to grow at the European level. Why we've been in so much interested in uh, Portugal? Well. We've been working in Portugal for uh, five or six years now. I can't even remember. Uh, it was a long time ago since we started <laughs> cooperating with BGI, then Inestec, and then Braga, et cetera, et cetera. Why the report? I think that part of the, of, of the discussion today will center about this year report about the startup uh, ecosystem in, uh, in Portugal, because uh, it is part of our mission to support the growth of local ecosystems and also get inspired by the insight that we gain from the reports that we co-published every year with BGI. 
just a few examples of how we've been using the insights that we've been gaining so far uh, from uh, the reports that we've been publishing. One of those is the, you, you will find during, uh, you will hear more about that during the discussion, but one problem that is uh, uh, pointed out in the report is the decreasing number of startups from, uh, uh, from Portugal since 2015 and, and until 2020. And this also discounting the uh, COVID effect. Well, one possible countermeasure that we set up is the establishment of what we call the innovation factory, which are means for, uh, in, uh, for a new products to be established in a very short time by our support, through our support co-funding and ending up in, in new companies created, new, new ventures created by the participants in the innovation, in the innovation uh, activity. Another problem pointed out in the, in, in the uh, report is the gap, exi the existing gap in the uh, pre in the pre-seed stage. So at the beginning, not only in Portugal, it's becoming more and more difficult for talented people, teams, etc., to find the necessary support in order to set up their company, because most of the investors tend to focus their efforts on the later stages, non-growth stages, in order to reap a back more benefit, uh, return on investment, etc. We set up a very specific action, which is the venture program, and been running it in uh, in Portugal for three years in a row now. Very successful, with very good teams that we've been able together with BGI to support and help grow and establish the venture. Now they are many, most of them are still thriving, and we are support continuing supporting them. Finally, there's a lot of presence of non-European and US, uh, US actors in, in Portugal. Uh, this is not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we decided to establish one of our satellites in Portugal, in Braga, being Braga, one of the three major uh, innovation uh, spots in uh, Portugal, as you will find in the report. Um, I think that you will find the reading the report as much instructive, helpful for your daily business in Portugal as uh, we have been finding it all the year through. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Fabio. It has been an amazing collaboration with BGI for quite some time right now. Uh, we hope to continue to do so in the future. So now to the next bit of the, of the webinar, which is, I'm just going to present with you some of the key highlights of the reports. Um, you can feel free to download the reports after this webinar is over or while this webinar is going on, and then we will get to the more interesting parts of the webinar. So I'm just going to briefly share my screen. Um, let me just do that right now. So yes, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. So um, let me first see if it's moving. Just a moment. Is it moving? Uh, no. No. What about now? No. No. We are in. I'm not sure if it's the the link, but yeah, now it's moving. Okay. Um, just a moment. Um. Perfect. We can see everything. Yes. Let me just. I'm just going, sorry, let me just do that again. <laughs> let me share now. Is it moving now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is well. Thank you for joining this webinar today, brought to you by BGI and EIT Digital. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to present to you some findings from our report of the Portuguese startup ecosystem. It's also to shed some light on how we can move forward as an ecosystem. I'll start my presentation by telling you a little bit about BGI. I will proceed to giving you the background up, about my presentation, then provide you with some facts on investments, revenues, and then we conclude. So um, who are we? Uh, BGI is a spin out of the MIT Portugal program, which was an innovation and entrepreneurship initiative to commercialize promising science and technology from research organizations in Portugal. 
Uh, we started as a technology transfer accelerator and our goal was to look for innovation in Portugal and take it to the United States. Uh, but it's been 10 years since we started and we have evolved so much that right now we run over 24 plus programs and projects that are split into three major categories, education, acceleration and innovation consulting. In the education category, we typically work with students from the master's to the PhD level, and our goal is to identify innovations and talents when they are still very early and help transform those ideas into products or ventures. Um, in the acceleration category, we work with individuals who are already entrepreneurs at the pre-seed and seed stage. Our goal is to identify talented founders who are disrupting or who intend to disrupt key verticals that we work with. And after we identify them, we support them by helping them to commercialize their innovations through venture capital financing and training. And finally, in the innovation consulting category, we help support corporates and large organizations who are looking to incorporate new innovations into their business models so that they can be much more efficient and serve their final customers better. We also use this opportunity to help startups who are in need of partners to scale. So uh, we work with a variety of partners in the ecosystem, but one of our major partners is EIT Digital. We work with EIT Digital in all three um, 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 focus vert categories. For instance, we manage pre-seed and seed acceleration programs called the Venture Program, where we provide up to 25,000 euros to entrepreneurs. In the innovation consulting category, we, we have open innovation programs where we engage with corporates looking for innovation. And finally, in the education category, we, we produce ecosystem reports and other tools such as this webinar, for example, that we help ecosystem players to stay informed so they can make better decisions. And I will be sharing highlights from the latest reports in this presentation. Um, so, I'm sorry, just a moment. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so one of the ecosystem reports we have released in Portugal um, is called the Portugal Startup Outlook. So what, it, what is it? So the report is a macro analysis of technology and technology enabled startups originating from Portugal. And when I say originating, I mean startups that are currently in Portugal and those that have moved headquarters. Um, so in preparing this report, we, we analyzed over 600 startups with less than five years within the period of 2015 and 2020. We also studied over 908 investment um, transactions, 488 investors, 2,677 market transactions, and 622 founders within the period of 2015 and 2020. And thanks to our enablers at Informa DMB, we were able to get a lot of the data we needed to produce this ecosystem report. So I'm going to start off by sharing the startup landscape. So um, from this graph, we observe a decline in the number of startups created from 2015 to 2020. We believe the observations in 2010 to 20 were obviously amplified by the uh, occurrence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in this second slide, um, um, about 10% of all the startups that we analyzed had switched headquarters from, um, from Portugal to outside Portugal. And when we break out, when we break down the distribution of the startups of those of the 10% that I'm talking about outside of Portugal, we see the choice destination is the US and the United Kingdom. And this is typically because of the capital and the market available in these countries. Um, in this other graph, um, we, we can see further evidence to show how young the startup ecosystem is in Portugal. I know many of you must have heard this, heard, heard this a lot. And as we can see about 64% of all the startups that we analyze, we are still in the seed and growth stage. So there is a gap between the seed funding and let's start stage funding in Portugal. So now let's move to the investment landscape. Um, it is, this graph is quite interesting. It's one of my favorites. Um, it is quite interesting to see that while most industries had a decline in 2020 due to the pandemic, there were certain industries such as the enterprise software and marketing and marketing and advertising industries have experienced some growth in investments. And this growth is driven by the fact that everyone is switching to a remote, remote mode. Workers are moving to remote work. So a lot of enterprise software platforms are being um, invested in because to, to leverage on the opportunity that exists right now. Also, a lot of companies are looking for new opportunities and new ways of reaching their, their customers. And that is why we can see, and this, that's one of the reasons why we see this uptick in investments in these particular industries. Also in this graph, so where's the money coming from? You know, so from this graph, we noticed that there's a minimal contribution of angel investors, corporate VCs and funds on funds. And this could be one of the reasons uh, many Portuguese startups have to look for later stage funding outside Portugal. This is also one of the reasons why there's a gap between the seed stage funding and also the later stage funding in Portugal. 
So let's look at the investor landscape. So we analyzed over 400 investors and many of them came from the US. The US has always been a strategic partner to Portugal, especially in regard to foreign direct investments. So one of the things you will see in the report is that domestic investors, we are very, very critical to um, early stage entrepreneurs, but in the later stage, um, investment from foreign sources was very, very critical. So let's look at the founders landscape. So we can see from this graph that the non-Portuguese founders contribute significantly to the ecosystem. We can see over 30% of founders that we analyzed were not Portuguese nationals. And one of the reasons why there's, um, there's a such a significant contribution of non-Portuguese founders is because um, we have a lot of programs that encourage um, um, founders, foreign founders to come to Portugal, such as the Startup Visa program. There's always, there's always been a significant gap in female and male founders, and there's not a lot of diversity in the ecosystem. And we still observe this trend in this current edition of the report. Also, one of the things that is interesting is that um, there's a, there's a, all the founders that we analyzed, a significant number, number of them received um, the education from foreign universities, um, from non-Portuguese universities, which is quite interesting. And, um, and it might be, it might rise, bring up questions about the entrepreneurship education here in Portugal. So what are the main conclusions of the reports? So we were able to illustrate sort of a pathway to which um, entrepreneurs go in Portugal. So first of all, Portuguese startups uh, at the early stage are usually supported by Portuguese investors. So when they need additional funding at the later stage, they usually require um, US investors. So when at the exit stage, usually European um, acquirers are the ones that acquire uh, Portuguese um, um, entrepreneurs. And when Portuguese entrepreneurs receive or get an exit, they either do two things. Either they, become, they go back into become Portuguese investors or they start up another venture. So you can actually find out more about um, the ecosystem, about this report and other reports that we do by downloading the reports. We also have some YouTube mini series where we interview a bunch, of, a lot of um, stakeholders to talk about um, the ecosystem. And we also have a Spotify channel that you can listen to all these interviews as well. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm gonna stop my sharing my screen right now. So um, now to the fun part, I try to move as fast as I can. Um, so um, I'm going to introduce um, Thomas Costas, um, the president of Startup Hitmap Europe. Um, um, Thomas will introduce himself and Thomas will be moderating the panel. And um, the way the panel would work is that um, Thomas will give an opportunity for each of the speakers to briefly introduce themselves about one minute and then we start a discussion um, regarding the ecosystem. So Thomas, over to you. Thank you, teacher. It's, it's a pleasure. And uh, hi to everyone. So some of you might remember me from being with EIT Digital, which uh, I have and I've worked with Fabio for many years. Uh, we've built up together the, the venture program. Now I have uh, left uh, EIT Digital to continue full time with a project that I had started uh, before, which is the startup heat map um, that, is, uh, that is mentioned here. Um, the startup heat map is just for quick introduction is, um, uh, is a platform where we show ecosystems in Europe and we show data as well as opportunities for founders in these ecosystems. So for example, there's also a profile for Lisbon that I invite you to, to check out, to find, uh, to, to discover what's happening in Lisbon, uh, to see what's, uh, what is uh, happening there in comparison to other hubs, um, how is investment developing in comparison to London, Berlin, other places, what is happening in terms of diversity, how many female founders do you have, how many foreign born founders and all of that. So. Uh, um, statistics like um, uh, BGI is creating um, with the um, with the report they feed into this um, this platform and they are um, also featured there. So I invite Otito to also update uh, this kind of information on the platform because we want to have this local knowledge on the platform, showing like the insights about each ecosystem from those who really know about it. So it would be great if uh, if we can showcase also the new report here and. Um, Maybe as a last uh, uh, point, I can mention that we launched yesterday a large report on women entrepreneurship um, that I can add maybe here in the chat, um, which is a very interesting overview of what has been happening in, in the field of support of female entrepreneurship in Europe. We look at a ranking uh, which cities are the most female friendly 
And actually here uh, you will see Lisbon in the category of medium-sized um, ecosystems ranking number four with 20% of female entrepreneurs. So uh, that, that's pretty um, uh, good. The average, unfortunately, is quite low across Europe. You only have 15.5% of uh, female entrepreneurs in, uh, in, in, in Europe. So I invite you to check this out and also to check out the, um, the heat map platform and the uh, Lisbon profile there to, to understand maybe a little bit of context and compare with the, with the new report that we just saw um, today. Um, now I want to uh, start to go to the panel and introduce um, the various speakers we have today. And uh, then I think during the discussion, we will we'll go again into all of these findings we, we just heard from Otito and uh, can discuss the developments and what could be potential actions to increase um, the, uh, the funding and also improve the investment culture in, uh, in Portugal. So let me go through and then everyone would please uh, introduce yourself in a, in a one minute uh, pitch um, so that we don't um, spend too much time on the uh, on the personal introductions. So please be concise. Um, let me start with um, the founder of LCG Brands, uh, Jody Tatiana Charles. Um, are you here? And uh, could am. you introduce you quickly? I am here. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Jody Tatiana Charles. I am in Boston where the sun is just about to rise. Um, I am the founder of LCG Brands, which is a marketing and branding firm for high impact, high growth entrepreneurs that are funded for small businesses um, anywhere around the globe, international immersions, small businesses, I mean, international companies that are sending one or two individuals to a new location, as well as nonprofits and NGOs. My background is I worked in the media for, I was an educator for six years. So I was an educator for six years. I was a television producer for four years, a radio producer for six years, and I've been a Romney secretary um, in the government for four years. And so um, I've always gotten to the point where um, marketing strategy is what I do. It's what I love. Different titles, but the same exact thing that I've done um, around the world, which I'm very, very proud of. Um, at the end of the day, people just don't know how to tell their stories. And it's one of those moments where as a first generation born in America, learning how to speak English, trying to figure out what my story was, trying to understand how I can communicate where I'm from, what I do. I love, love, love doing it for other people and educating individuals about how their story is by far the number one thing to define who they are, their expertise, and how their companies will grow. And we'll get into that a lot more when we're discussing, but for the most part, marketing is what I love. Um, I've challenged myself to go into different industries to make sure that I'm really, really great at what I do. And I now travel all over the world to do the same exact thing. So I'm so happy to be here with everyone. I talk fast, but I'm passionate about what I do and to hear about you guys. Fantastic. Welcome, Jody Tatiana. Pleasure to have you. And of course, you will update us uh, by the minute on updates on the presidential run, right? Oh. So, <laughs> so if, you, if you have news, interrupt us. <laughs> Good. So next in line would be Carol Tarr, lecturer at uh, Neon Road Business uh, University. Yes. Good uh, morning or good afternoon. It is here in Amsterdam. Um, I'm Carol Tarr. I'm a lecturer at Neon Road Business University um, here in the Netherlands. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. So I also have my eyes on certain figures coming up and changing by the minute. I'm um, coming out of the U.S. Uh, my background, I'm from an entrepreneurial family, so I have that natural hustle in me. <laughs> um, I have my own startup, Atomic Spices, but I've been working in the last five years in entrepreneurial and small business education, um, mostly looking at it from the organizational behavioral angle and the sociology of consumers and behavioral change, initiating behavioral change inside. Um, I've worked in many incubators. I worked with the Next Women. Um, an organization in the Netherlands uh, dedicated to promoting funding with female uh, women-led businesses. Um, unfortunately, that is getting worse. And the last figures were out, 1.6% it was of VC funding going to women entrepreneurs in the Netherlands last year. 40 people signed, 40 VCs signed on to the paper Fundright to promote it. And now it's gone down to 1%, actually it's less than 1%. And the number of mixed teams, investment going to mixed teams has gone up to 18%, which is good from 16%, but still most capital is uh, eluding women in 
entirely. And it's really something now that we're focusing on it, it's getting worse. And I worked on the, I was the architect for the Film Power Your Growth Program, which was meant to um, educate investors and bankers in cognitive biases when they're making decisions about um, lending or investing. And, but also on the other hand, to educate women um, who had startups in thinking more ambitiously and being growth minded. And this was um, initiated at the request of Queen Maxima who came, comes out of an investment banking background. So my focus is on the Netherlands and we're doing really poorly. And I'm working now on the EU level with the knowledge for innovation, um, the, EU, um, the um, innovation summits at the um, European Union parliament. And I can tell you that the Iberian women have a lock on it. There are no Northern, um, Northern European women involved in it at all, except for myself and a couple of others. So um, I can see that there's real interest in Spain and Portugal towards addressing these in issues and in innovation because not having diversity and not having intersectional diversity where you check more than one box um, and how different you are really stifles innovation and keeps conversations from developing. Great, thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome to the panel. And already some very good uh, discussion points to start with. We have to wait three more speakers until we can answer. Um, so we have Antonio Martin, uh, Martinez from uh, Portugal Ventures with us. Antonio. Hello, all. good morning. Um, first of all, thank you for having us here and congratulations for the, the great report. Um, I'm I'm investment manager at Portugal Ventures. Um, although actually my my personal background is on marketing uh, and comms, so I can relate a lot to what to everything that was already said um, about telling stories and and changing behaviors. Um, I've worked within the PR industry for um, almost ten years, so um, I do relate a lot to, a lot a lot to that. Um, and I think for us here at, at Portugal Ventures, as, as you can see also from, from, from the report, we are one of the major uh, investors in, in, in Portugal. Uh, and we mostly invest um, um, on, on, on seed rounds. Um, but as, as, as Fabio was pointing out in the, in the initial remarks, we actually, we, we, we also do feel a lot uh, that the number, that the number of, of earlier stage startups is decreasing. And that there is that um, that gap that is also being created on a very very initial initial stage, and that's kind of the reason why this year we have also decided to to launch a program that precede very very precede, um, but in one thing in one but focus on one thing that we, that that kind of kind of also relates to this um, intersectional diversity that was being mentioned. Uh, which is fo very much focused on the on the relationship between um, in, in, um, between universities, um, incubators, and accelerators. Um, and I believe actually BGI, you had a you had a couple of a couple of pro projects applying to the program. Um, um, and so we, we we do see that that trend is starting to to show up in in, in Portugal, uh, which by the end is an issue for us who mostly invest uh, on, on seed stage because it means that, that in one year and one year and a half, we will have very few projects to, to, to invest in. So uh, I think that the rest is more for the, for the panel discussion. Fantastic, good. Thank you for the introduction, Antonio, and again, already some yeah. content. Thank you, welcome to the panel. And then uh, Sophia from BGI, if you want to introduce yourself as well, please. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm still getting used to, for you not being EIT Digital because since the moment I joined BGI, you were indeed from uh, EIT Digital and have been with us on this path. So I'm doing business development at BGI, uh, looking for these programs that uh, Otish presented, education, acceleration and open innovation. Uh, but most importantly, supporting the startups doing it. And so that's how I get to meet a lot of people like Antonio. <laughs> PV is indeed very important in Portugal. It's the, the biggest, the largest VC investing. Um, and so uh, in this sense, we support the startups uh, not only getting investment, but also getting clients, which we believe it's the hardest point at this moment for the startups. Um, of, of course, with the pandemic, we had a lot of startups suffering. Uh, the e-commerce ones had the boom, 
it was a blast, but the others were quite difficult, especially the ones B2B, which are most of the startups we work with. Um, my background is also, uh, it's also management. I'm part of this generation in Portugal that is Portuguese, but study outside. Um, and indeed, uh, we can still feel a little bit the note, especially I think that the Portuguese can, can, can feel this, um, that the outside sometimes even boosts a little bit more to work with, with startups. Um, I remember being in Sweden and then they called, they told me that there was a, a startup. I was like, a startup, what is that? <laughs> I didn't even know. And yes, of course, now I work with them. I need to know them very well. Um, but it is a topic that I think would be also interesting to discuss uh, here today. And of course, I'm very, I'm very glad, glad to discuss this and debate this with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sophia, and welcome to your own panel. Um, so then last one is Rodrigo Bernardo um, in former DB, which is like a person that's very familiar with statistics, I suppose. Rodrigo, are you here? We can't hear you yet. Okay, sorry, because uh, <laughs> when I was about to enter, my my connection uh, starts to be unstable. So I hope you can hear me well. Um, well, first of all, good morning to everyone. Thanks um, to BGI for the invitation for the and, and congratulate you congratulate you on the initiative. Uh, we we I, I work for Informa DNB. Um, well, the DNB stands for Dun and Bradstreet. We are the the partner of uh, Dun and Bradstreet in in Portugal. And uh, for those who don't know us or don't know Dun and Bradstreet, we 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 lead the market of business information. We manage the largest uh, database of uh, uh, business information and in, of uh, uh, companies uh, in Portugal. And uh, um, we, we we kind of uh, a supporting actor in this uh, uh, in this ecosystem. And uh, uh, well, we, we uh, with BGI we we started a partnership uh, because we we strongly believe in the power of the information and uh, the the importance of uh, spread the word and to to disseminate uh, reliable, reliable and and uh, uh, up to date information. And that's why we we. We are in this uh, environment and uh, uh, well, I work in the sales area and uh, um, we, 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 we tend to, to uh, spread the, 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 the word as I, as, I, as I said. And we, we, uh, we, are, or we are always uh, uh, trying to, to send the, 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 the saying the the need of the the and the importance of uh, having uh, projects like BGI has been developing and uh, uh, the importance of uh, uh, the 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 clear and uh, reliable reliable information. So thank you all for the 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 possibility to to use our data through in this case through bgi thank you bernardo welcome to the panel as well great so we had um the the introduction round and now um, we go to the to the discussion so i would like to um uh, have like a kind of sexual approach so saying like okay we discuss one topic everyone jumps in gives their um their opinion and we discuss it a bit before we then jump to the to 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 the next big um theme um so it doesn't go completely um uh, wild <laughs> so let's start maybe with um the um the overall topic which uh, i think was mentioned quite a bit which is the um the investment landscape and here i think the observation that was mentioned a lot is the drought that we saw in the early stages so um we um um, we, we see a, a funnel that is uh, narrowing. We see that, um, that, that fewer um, early stage startups are um, founded or are supported. So my question would be to the, to the group, um, what is your perception on this? And, um, and uh, what are maybe the, the reasons that you speculate are behind this? Who wants to go first? Well, I, I can go. <laughs> if no one volunteers, I'll <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, 
Ah, okay. <laughs> it was consolidating. Um, I think that uh, one of I think that the pandemic, of course, is going to scare uh, some people away. Um, I think that the Portuguese, at least in Portugal, Portuguese government is trying to fight that and provide more and more um, uh, funding on early stage startups. Sometimes it might also provide us some uh, false positives because you have a lot of startups who exist for two, three years. And in the end, they haven't talked with the market yet. They haven't talked with any clients. And, you know, you assume that they will have something because you've seen in, in so many demo days from incubators, etc. And then in the end, you realize that um, they are being supported with these grants. And so I think that in terms of early stage, you can see a lot of them uh, failing uh, because of this, this support. And, um, and this could be one of the reasons in, in, in my, my perspective, but I'll pass on to the other speakers. I'll jump in. Um, to echo what Sophia said, I think COVID has a lot to do with it and you have a lot of failing um, businesses right now. And I think for um, investors that, you know, their primary commitment is going to be shoring up um, these businesses that they've already um, have invested in to make sure they lose as little as possible because there's just massive losses going on all around. Um, I think that maybe it's just a matter of waiting out because I think um, at the same time, there's a lot of talent being absorbed by larger corporations is not the same way. And you find people who are now looking at opportunities to perhaps be begin their own business because of being let go. Um, so I think we're sort of in a holding pattern at this moment as everyone wants to see how um, all these uncertainties shake out like the you know, US election among and Brexit among them uh, because in Portugal and also in the Netherlands, so much funding comes from abroad that there are all sorts of issues um, um, that are distracting at this moment. So um, I'm hoping that it will come back. I'm hoping it comes back in a different form, like going towards um, businesses that were overlooked before the gyms um, and perhaps to bring more capital back towards women and minority businesses, which we're seeing in the corporate um, VC space and also in impact because that's now become impact and in faith-based uh, initial initiative investment. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you. Definitely, have, and we're gonna have work. We're just gonna three for of like a three three um, voices of the women, but I'm gonna definitely echo on that, and I'm gonna add to that. Um, so in the states, money's being money is flowing through. Um, we never give up a great crisis. Like I mean, to to give up the opportunity to grow during a crisis is just purely silly. 10 years ago, when I started my company, I was in my MBA program. The world had imploded 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And literally the amount of companies that came out of that was shocking. The entrepreneur, I mean, the venture capitalists, the angel funders, um, the friends and family, they remember that it was just so close. And so a lot of individuals are actually pulling into small businesses as well as entrepreneurs and startups because they know how to talk about it. They know exactly how to literally verbalize, look, look at me, look at me, look what I'm working on. Individuals that are furloughed, laid off, or just, I have a job and I hate it, and I'm at home and I'm now doing the investigation of who I should go to, what I should be doing, um, I'm still getting paid and I'm developing that. They're having these conversations because guess what? Everyone is home. Everyone is home. And because everyone's at home, I'm able to get to that investor that I was never able to get to because the secretary, the manager, the director blocked me from that individual. So over here, we are seeing a lot of international companies engaging a lot with investors and a lot with the angels because they know everyone that's home. They know that I would have never gotten FaceTime. And even if I was able to come into the States, I was never able to, I was ne never going to be able to find them. So on our side, we are seeing a lot more uptick in a lot of early stage funding because a lot of individuals are seeing people either pairing with one another, they're coming through the universities, they're coming through these different accelerators, and they're able to get a lot of FaceTime because again, we're seeing each other so clearly now and having deeper conversations on a higher level to say, you know what, absolutely yes or absolutely no, whether I'm gonna fund you. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, in a way there's more of a level playing field in the international space because you can also reach out to big shots that normally would have uh, been hard to reach. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you allow me to pick up on to pick up on 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 that, and 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 it would be interesting if to, to understand if Sophia and Otito also feel this or not. Um, but I see um, a very big change uh, on the approach that 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 companies and startups uh, take on um, when it comes to the international markets. 
and obviously as 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 as, as sport as it's Portugal's internal market, and it's also pointed out in the in the report, is is small. Um, any Portuguese company that wants to get funded uh, for a seed stage and later and later stages, they need to approach um, international and global markets uh, right from the beginning. Um, and I think that's part of the change that we are also seeing uh, and. As all the money, the money cycle, it's a cycle that influences um, bits uh, and parts of, of the whole cycle. Um, I think that we are probably also also starting to see that change um, in earlier stage startups, which might contribute to to to, to the decrease uh, on on earlier funding on the earlier funding because they really need to to change the approach that they were having before. Um, I mean, for us, um, it's, it's very hard to look at a project that, that comes and says that they want to sell uh, only in Portugal, right? Because we are very much focused on helping them internationalize. But that is, that is a mindset, that is a mindset, right? And the mindset that has to be there right from the beginning, um, which bottom line kind of also relates to the, diverse, to, the, to, the, to the diversity issue. Because if the company is not diverse, eno diver, di diverse enough, then they will never have these different changes on perspectives and that allow them uh, to, to move further and to, and to approach uh, and to better approach the, the markets outside of Portugal. Interesting. Yeah. So to to circle back maybe to the to the um, first theme that we wanted to cover is the early stage situation. Um, and there was a question uh, coming through the chat um, by uh, Ryane, uh, which is about the universities and saying like in the chart in the uh, in the report there is a, a clear um, indication that most founders have studied abroad. Um, so do Portuguese um, uh, universities lack that entrepreneurial spirit, that entrepreneurial education, and uh, how how to accelerate and change that. So, is is that something you observe that uh, that Portuguese universities are slower in um, in in bringing out entrepreneurs or or not so successful? Uh, well, I've I've had I've had I've had um, the opportunity to also uh, study a, a bit abroad and spend a couple of months in 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 Boston. Um, I think the biggest difference that I see from what's, what happens there um, and, and what happens here um, is that everybody literally sits around the same square, which means that we can easily observe that the tech guys speak to the management guys who then speak to the corporates um, and working all together, they can, they can, they can find um, find amazing, amazing products and amazing and amazing startups. I think we also we we have all of that here. So we have the knowledge, we have the the skills. Um, I mean, our engineering degrees are stick out uh, internationally, and we can find big corporates trying to hire our our engineers. So I don't think that it's that's that much a matter of talent. It's uh, it's more a matter that then we all sit within our own bubble um, and engineers don't speak to guys who have studied management and that can, and that can turn that amazing research and that amazing, that, 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 that amazing research into actually a product that's sellable in the market. And, and we do feel a lot uh, when, we look, mm -hmm. when we look at that. It's not, sometimes it's not that the idea is it's not good, is that, that it's not um, that it's not sellable. And I think in the end, um, BGI does play a, a, a huge role here, right? I can also add something on this. This is such a huge problem for us right now uh, that the Portuguese National Agency for Innovation, which is called ANI, uh, is investing actively on a program called Born from Knowledge, which is we go to the universities, we talk with the researchers who have spin outs or potential spin outs, and we support them on giving that step. They are TTO of well, they are the tech, uh, tech transfer offices in uh, our universities, 
Um, most of them are really focused on writing uh, non-dilutive applications, grants for Horizon Europe, uh, Portugal 2020 and other funds as such. Um, and so sometimes it's really missing this part of getting the, the hands on the client. I, I go back to the same problem, but this is something we feel in Portugal that is so big, so big, not just in Portugal. We work with companies from 74 different countries because we have a connection with MIT. Uh, that's how we met dear Jody. <laughs> and so we go to Boston and we take European entrepreneurs. And this is, I think, a problem maybe in Portugal a little bit uh, bigger because our ecosystem is green. It's not mature for sure. And it's still missing a lot that uh, the techie people, if you come from an engineering school, if you come from um, any technical areas where you typically have deep tech coming from, right? We managers are great, but we don't invent these things on a lab for sure. And so uh, we need these guys to have a little bit more of the perception of the business. Typically, even the people that you see, co-founders from these uh, technical areas, they got this experience out of their uh, careers, of their jobs. And so we don't have still uh, that part. I came from one of the business schools in Portugal that is more advanced. It's even on the top of Financial Times worldwide. And entrepreneurship was one subject that we could choose that would not even count that much uh, for your credits in the end of the year. So it's not, it's definitely not mandatory. It's extremely optional. And in most of the universities, it's not even an option. So it is a problem right now still with education. And, and this will have to go deeper than I need. It will have to go deeper uh, with the ministries potentially and with some reformulation in how uh, the subjects are being provided to the students if you know it is intended as a political agenda for Portugal to become to to invest on this which I believe is because has been working very very well so far very interesting um, so to close this this subject maybe one one comment that I, I've seen like um, uh, I've seen that in in general in Europe we actually see less early stage funding over the the last two years. So there, there's quite a drastic decline in the uh, in the in the funding between half a million and two million. I think it's like a third down from 2018, the level now. So it, it seems that it's maybe not necessarily uh, only the pandemic, but actually we we do have like a very strong shift towards uh, later stage funding. And in the early stages, um, there is maybe even less funnel, but also less money um, available. Um, that could be a bit of a correction. There was a lot of grants and so on, but um, uh, now also we see that there is a contraction, and, and it might uh, might be a problem. Um, there might be also the effect that more early stage startups are going to the U.S. as uh, um, <laughs> the American um, participants on the. Um, <laughs> on the panel set already they are very open to invest during a crisis as well so that's a danger for europe i i would say there was a there was a question on um uh, on the youtube channel um the data on the university education is it post grad education or is it uh, is it um bachelors so i so i guess i could i should answer that question <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Okay, yeah. So yes, so at least um, all the founders there at least have um, a degree um, from um, a foreign university. So most of them, uh, most of the two percent talks about uh, they, them getting a lot of additional inf um, um, education from um, from foreign universities. However, um, those who got foreign universities didn't necessarily have to have um, a Portuguese degree. So many people got their degrees from abroad um, um, as well. Okay. And, I can and jump I, in yeah. mm -hmm. yes, really please. quickly yeah. on the subject of education before we close that. Um, uh -huh. I've been involved with um, the development of a program from the very beginning on um, um, like a, the, the college level or um, first stage university level on um, entrepreneurial education. And there's like 440 points in the EU guidelines on what needs to be covered in um, entrepreneurial education from all the levels from high school up to um, say a doctorate degree. And the, the thing is where um, it takes the entrepreneur's point of view that they need to understand these things. But in terms of like for investors, 
to um, know about how to invest in startups or how to invest in entrepreneurs, that's not covered the same way. And I find that um, these entrepreneurship programs, because I have been involved directly with creating one, so I'm very much a fault of it, um, create sort of a monolithic culture in how to solve problems and how to grow your business. And there's only one way to do it and you do this and you do that. But when you're on the ground and it really works, yeah, you have to put together all kinds of messy cap tables to get it to, to, to happen. Um, so th there's a problem with the education right now and we're not getting a pipeline early enough into like high schools and to get the diversity that we want. Um, so I just want to address that, that, that the entrepreneurial education is, an, is a problem across the EU. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I think this is very much to the to the to the point, and it, we which brings us also to the second topic, um, which I want to connect here, which is the diversity. It has been mentioned a lot already. So um, one point you could bring up uh, when you look at these uh, foreign uh, degrees is also that that actually is is. Uh, a characteristic of diversity. So, and I think Portugal has this, this benefit that there's a lot of international uh, talent and entrepreneurs coming in that, that enrich the, the, the ecosystem. So in that sense, I think um, there you have a strong point in Portugal for diversity, but how does it look on the, on the other dimensions of diversity, uh, female entrepreneurship, um, uh, also different, uh, different uh, groups, like different backgrounds and so on. What is the, what is your impression on how is Portugal doing on the diversity front? Uh, I, I can go actually BGI. Uh, we are fortunate to have a lot of women working at BGI. <laughs> it's actually, we even if we work with deep tech startups, we have a half-half team. And so we, we are part of Women in Tech, which is a global organization. And we are even organizing events with them. Um, one of the interesting things this year, we, are, we were conducting a project for the municipality of Lisbon, precisely because this was one of the main topics, uh, women in, in tech, women in, in innovation, entrepreneurship. And these were interviews, actually. So this was not uh, based on data we gathered. This was more like um, really market research with interviews with a lot of entrepreneurs. And we, there's a, a fact that is very interesting. The women that typically work with the startups are the CEOs or co-founders. Um, so, which is, which is interesting, which means that probably there are many startups being led by uh, uh, male founders who, who don't think about that problem or who, who are not attracting women to their, to their teams. Um, and typically you have then uh, startups like Define Crowd that are led by women and then they hire a lot of women for, just to try to, to dismantle the statistics. And, and then you have a huge debate on should we do this, should we promote should we have uh, uh, lowest prices for women to go to web summit just because they are women? And so then the, the discussion is huge. The reality is um, th there's a lot of uh, papers even about this topic saying that biologically and um, instinctively uh, women would be trying to get a safer environment than men. I want to I want to discuss much on that. There might be really a lot of reasons. In Portugal, we start with one that is cultural. Okay, it is much more typical. And if we compare even Europe with US, we are much more risk averse. And culturally, women in Portugal are even more uh, risk averse. Uh, so uh, if you want to do, this is very common. This is even a joke in Portugal. If you want to do a risky investment, don't tell your wife. So, um, so it's, it's a reality that we, we live in. Uh, and, and of course, then there are industries that, uh, before this, I was working in the luxury area. The luxury area, we don't have men. There's a, a problem. People have to hire men just to keep the balance so it's not 100% women. And then, of course, in areas that are more technical and typically, uh, when, you, when you are a kid, you give uh, uh, girls to play with Barbies and you give small things, engineering things to men. So it starts when you're really, really small, okay? You don't give a drone to a girl typically, right? If you think about it, your kids, your cousins, your siblings, it's still not very common. And so our interests are also aligned with what we are used to learn, play with. And so of course, when you get, uh, when you are an adult, you have, your mind has been also shaped with your experiences. So we are not prone to go to more technical areas and most start, well, startup, is a, a, typically a digital, a tech 
company, which are areas that we are still not having a lot. I'm just going to finalize with the fact that on the interviews we did with the entrepreneurs, half of the Portuguese entrepreneurs in the municipality of Lisbon that were interviewed were foreigner, which means that even the women we have leading startups were not Portuguese, half of them were not Portuguese. So I think that's also a sign that probably this is a mixture of cultures, maybe US, maybe other countries bring as well uh, these, uh, let's be more risk lovers. And then of course, naturally people will develop these skills. This would be uh, my, my, point, uh, my point of view. I think that Jody must want to jump in and say something. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I have to say that, um, uh, so the sun's coming up so you can see it like coming out of my window. Um, so I think that the biggest thing that people have to really realize is how do you, do, how do you describe and how do you define diversity? Diversity for so many people could be either black, white, it could be we'll call female, male, where diversity in industry for me and the way I, that I see it is you're dealing with women owned businesses, you're dealing with small owned businesses, veteran owned businesses. Um, uh, uh, disabled owned businesses, um, lesbian, gay businesses. You're dealing with so many different individuals that are owning businesses and they're small, very unique businesses. Um, every country that I go to, my number one thing that I do every single time I go to any country is I get up in the morning, I go for a run. I go for the run because in the morning because no one is up yet. You get to see the community. You get to see what stores, what shops, what areas are vibrant. Small businesses are up early. They're like cleaning up their areas. I go, they are innovative in every, in every single way. People just assume diversity, big companies, venture capitalists. Guess what? Those angel funders are your friends. They're your rich friends. They want to be engaged. They don't have children. They don't want to give to their schools or universities because the schools and universities are not keeping up to their brand, but they want to have their legacy live on through something. And guess what? Those startups are a place to be. So you automatically assume venture capitalists there's other ways of getting money to those small businesses that are very, very diverse. Um, I could be right here in the center, one mile in any direction when I'm in Lisbon, one mile in any direction, and I can find a diverse small business entrepreneur innovator. One mile. A lot of people don't want to leave their offices. They don't want to leave their areas. They, don't, they say they want diversity, but they're not really defining it, nor are they going out to look for it. If you want to learn about a lion, you're not learning about a lion in a zoo or in a, in a park, a closed park. You're going to a safari. You're learning about a lion in their environment. You want to learn about the entrepreneurs, the innovators that are in the community, and you want to be able to invest in them. You have to go out and find them because that's when you get a diverse pool of individuals. There's so many people that are doing amazing things, but they're never known. They don't know about accelerators. Sophia said it earlier. What's a startup? What's that? I mean, imagine the, 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 the brilliant minds that are out there right now in your neighborhoods that are creating something in their homes and you have no idea who they are and they don't know who you are. So I literally ask everyone, if you want to sit there and build diversity, you have to find creative ways, creative ways to get out. And guess what? A lot of people are like, oh yeah, my family and my friends have no idea what I do in my career. I go around and talk about it. It's only my LinkedIn community. Start talking to your friends and family because they know people that you may want to invest in that are diverse. And I think that people need to stretch out their communities and start speaking to their friends and families because that gem is out there. And unless you, the, the, the brilliant minds that we are, unless you are out there talking and asking those right questions, you're never gonna know. And that diversity pool is gonna continue to shrink because the right people aren't being found. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Love what I do, love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you for the input. It's it's really a, uh, so if I understand correctly, it was really about understanding that there is much more out there than let's say the investment that we see today uh, make us believe. Um, so uh, the investment is very biased. Uh, I remember that uh, Carol, you started off with explaining a bit your your experience on working on uh, cognitive bias, and uh, and I would like to hear your opinion on on are we all biased? Are we all um, uh, do we have a blind eye um, on uh, on women or underrepresented groups? Um, uh, do we need to change, or what is the problem? Well, it's interesting you asked me that because I have since stopped doing trainings on cognitive bias because I found that, um, yeah, the answer to your question is yes, absolutely. 
um, but does it give us a pass just to attend a training on it? And then we can just go back to what we were doing saying, oh yeah, well, we're all biased. I'm biased, you're biased with just what we do. I'm only going with these people over here, you know? <laughs> so I've stopped doing that. I think there must be a better way. I am trying to disrupt that um, bias trainings. Um, so watch this space because I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. So, uh, but what is it? What is the what is the idea now? Like, so, what do you think is uh, what what should be done if we don't do trainings? What do we do? Um, the trainings, as they exist, are not enough. That's that's what I've noticed. Um, what I found to really really work was to actually bring people together, like this Fempower Your Growth program we worked on. We actually brought a banker a decision-making banker or a decision-making investor and paired them with um, a, a female entrepreneur and got them together and had them take a walk and just get to talk to each other and understand that a lot of times we're not even using the same language. We don't know what the expectations are from each other and just to bring this together. And then there's this knowledge moving forward because it's not about bias. It's about, um, kind of cutting short those biases that we all have and um, getting to know each other and just improving like a personal and professional development, just understanding each other and opening the dialogue and, you know, with investors bringing in the deal flow. And if you bring these people together and get them talking in the same room, in the same space with the same kind of um, agenda, then that, that short tracks everything and short circuits all the problems. Mm -hmm. Great. Any direct reactions to this? Anyone feeling like, oh, I have a completely different idea? No, no. Um, just let me jump in. I, I, I strongly believe in everything that was said, uh, and I do believe in Portugal. It's also a cultural issue. Um, that kind of uh, communication and cooperation, it's uh, something we definitely have to improve. And, uh, and these uh, programs and this uh, ecosystem, what is trying to do, to do since, I don't know, 10 years uh, ago, it's that kind of uh, diminishing this gap. And I do believe that uh, uh, mainly people uh, uh, don't have, uh, aren't, are not available to listen everyone that uh, knocks on the door, but uh, uh, that is, that is, uh, beginning to change and I believe that closed that gap that it was uh, told by uh, Jody and Sofia and I do believe it's uh, also cultural in Portugal risk averse and, and uh, the, the lack of, of uh, uh, communication uh, between all the actors uh, of, the, of the business to, to uh, work. Okay, so there was a there was a little hiccup in the uh, in the transmission, but I think we understood. Um, Sorry. Uh, so, so, thank you. So, so, so Thomas, let me. So there, there are some questions, and I think Carol might have to drop out soon. <laughs> so, but uh, Carol, feel free if you need to drop out, um, you can you can feel free to drop out. Um, but there are some questions from YouTube, and so mm -hmm. I, I, so perhaps I, I put them in the chat. Um, so maybe I can read out them, uh, or if you want to read them out, um, maybe that might. Um, but I put some of the we put some of the questions from YouTube on the chats right now. So, mm -hmm. so we have so we have Galina who is actually asking you, Thomas, uh, if you could possibly share the report about the female entrepreneurship that you were talking about. Uh, so if you can share then the link with our chat, we can also put on YouTube. And I think that this could also answer the question of Emmanuel Zilio who wants to have more information about women uh, taking business risks. Um, then we also have here a question that we should address this reduced investment culture in Portugal to the government support when comparing to another country, we find US the stronger uh, programs to VCs, business angels, and even to, to startups. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, to the panel. Question, because I didn't understand. I didn't. I it got, there was like you put in. You put in so much information that I I missed the question. So the question is the number. Uh, so basically, says we should address this reduced investment culture in Portugal 
to the government support. When comparing to another country, we find US as a stronger program to VCs and BAs and even to startups. Um, it's more of a comment from some some of the one viewer. Don't know if anyone wants to elaborate on that. Mm. So do you think that uh, Portugal uh, still has too little government support for startups? That's maybe the question. Well, I can, well, I can maybe uh, address that a bit, but mostly by saying that we are, as everybody, as everybody knows, um, at least partially state-owned um, and one of the major investors in Portugal. Okay, so <laughs> uh, doesn't, which doesn't which which by the end doesn't mean that there's more work to do, right? I think there's always more work to do, and as things evolve, you need to find new different new different solutions. Um, obviously, obviously, obviously that obviously and and, and obviously also 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 government government programs need need to re reinvent themselves. But I think I think in the past few years there has been a lot of investment from the government to create and to help building the, the ecosystem in Portugal. Mm -hmm. may, may I ask as a, as a follow on to this, this question, like um, just a little bit heretic, um, is, uh, does every country need to have a, a, a VC investment arm? <laughs> So do you do you think like this is uh, that um, it's it's a necessity to have like a VC investment firm from the government in every country? Uh, well, I think I think I think it and as we've seen in Portugal, it has helped creating the ecosystem. I mean, we were alone for a long time, and now we are not alone anymore, right? And we have and we have um, other VC investors and also other VC investors that are not. Um, that are also starting to invest on on later stages, uh, which was one of the points that has been uh, addressed addressed a lot. Um, I think that's I think I think that's something that 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 and, and and probably you guys can can bring in other perspectives, but it's quite it's been quite common across Europe and across mm -hmm. other European countries as a way of developing the the ecosystem. One of the things that I'm seeing more and more um, globally is that the, through the universities and colleges, a lot of the alumni are coming together and creating their own angel or venture capitalist firms where it's not attached to the government, but it's able to support the school that they attended. So that's the whole entire concept of alumni coming together, seeing that innovation, seeing what the school is doing and finding other ways to support the school by not just giving, here's a check and buy, build another gym, um, or build another cafeteria, but more so I'm investing in my school by investing in the students on a different level. And so I'm seeing that happening more and more. It's growing, it's a growing initiative that we can stay involved in our universities and colleges as alumni. We are seeing what the new generation is, um, is developing. If we want to, we can acquire them as we, they grow. So that synergy is really getting momentum um, because why not invest in as well as grow your own business by acquiring those individuals that you believe in because they have the same sort of education as you. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very, very interesting concept that differs a bit from the government funding, mm -hmm. saying like there is bottom-up uh, grassroots organizations that fundraise to support mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and to support ventures. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other approach being, being like, okay, government coming in and, uh, and creating funds that uh, invest from... Uh, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand upwards. But, but let me just let me just point point out about something that Sophia was was mentioning before. You can't forget that ten years ago, nobody in Portugal knew what a startup was. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really even as an investor, right, and the risk profile of investing in 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 in, in a startup would necessarily have to make you a very a very uh, very prone to taking to taking in a, a huge risk. Mm -hmm. I think that you have to think about that. Everyone didn't know the word start up, but they know innovators and entrepreneurs. And so I think the messaging has to be different. So the way people understand what this means, because you say the word startup and most people are going to say, I mean, even in the States, a lot of people have no idea what that means, or they're just thinking, 
oh, a bunch of kids hanging out at Starbucks, drinking coffee, coming up with a fun. <laughs> but they're not, but the second you say entrepreneur or innovator, they know it's that store or that thing that's being grown around them. So I think the messaging behind it has to change for more people to be engaged and understand what their, what the value is for them. But, mm-hmm. but I would, I would, I, I, I would just say that I, mean, I think that comes with, or probably also with the characteristics of the country and being, I mean, not a, not a, not a huge country. That I think we have been main, main, we have been managing to change that perception within the within the, within the last few years. And also because if we look at at some of the most successful companies that are pointed out within within the media, uh, they are pointed out as being startups. Right. If you think about out systems, far fetch, um, even defined crowd or, or talk desk, right? They are presented as startups um, and very, very successful Portuguese companies. Yeah. So, and, and I, 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 yeah. This is really funny because uh, when I went to when when Fitzai became a unicorn and I was like so excited I went to Boston like one week after and so I was meeting I remember one of our mentors and I was like oh my god we are Cesar, we have a unicorn now uh, in Portugal it's out system and then just goes on Google like this company is 17 years this is not a startup this is not a unicorn like they they have crossed the line like for Portuguese people it is <laughs> so it's like don't take that away from us. So even this is interesting, Jody, because for us, a startup, like for, you know, Americans, it's, it's like five years. For us, startups can take longer because we are still so early on the ecosystem that even between you and me, startup may ha- might have, well, actually has a different meaning. So, so that's also something to, to point out. And it's true, uh, Portugal Ventures has been around and for you to have an idea, it's uh, from all money that has ever been put in startups in Portugal. Portugal Ventures is the one that has put more money by far. And it comes, and part of it comes from public money, from the government. So uh, we, 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 we had that need uh, for sure in the past. And you still have a lot of grants coming from uh, the Portuguese government to support startups. And I'm really sure based on all the alumni we have from Portugal, that if it was not from that public money that Portuguese government is injecting on them, they, they wouldn't be here. And uh, you have been mentoring many of them, super talented, that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't made it. So in Portugal, it, we still rely on the Portuguese government for that. And I think that more and more they realize that that's the, that's the way until we have, as Antonio was saying, until we have uh, the Portugal ventures of life, not alone anymore, with more, more ecosystem. What we can notice from the Outlook report and the scale-up report and all the reports that BGI team has been writing is that most of the money that we need for, for startups to actually scale up, as Antonio also said, they are not Portuguese. We still don't have that amount to invest in. Uh, like we get really excited to have a 70 million fund. That's already, whoa. Okay, so it's, um, it's growing. I think that maybe if we have this talk in five or six years, it will be different, but it will take time. Yeah. Very interesting. I just, want, I just mm-hmm. want to add really quickly where Antonio, you focus on how Portugal is small. Last year, I was in Israel, Bulgaria, uh, Portugal, Massachusetts is not large, and then we have Rhode Island. Small yet mighty. Small yet mighty, yeah. because those that that area of being small literally speaks to everyone else that's out there. And again, I can't say this enough: a lot of people are not messaging the right way for people to back, actually find ways to be engaged. And the reach of that message is very important. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me just let me just say something, Julie. Really, I completely agree with you, and I think we should be comparing us more to to exactly to those to those countries. And I think when we when we see and that's that's kind of the, the, the Peter was point, trying to point out in the beginning, when we compare ourselves to Israel, if you, if you speak if you speak to an Israeli company, their market is not Israel, right? Their market is the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the biggest change that we are already feeling here, right? That 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 we we we, we test things in Portugal. It's a good way to get that proof of concept, the initial clients, and then you need to sell to the world. Um, but that requires a change in the in the mindset of entrepreneurs as well, because you need to to get out of your comfort zone, yeah. right? It's it's easy it's it's 
easier, easier to sell, to sell, to sell, to sell within your home country where, where you might know someone who knows someone. And it's completely different to get out there into the, into the global markets where you don't know anybody um, and you need to build everything from scratch. And I think from the investments that we've been making, I say in the past year, past year and a half, the, we see that that mentality is, is, is starting to be there, that, that yeah. the goal is to address the world. Yeah, yeah, and this is so important that uh, BGI was like we we start as a governmental institution, as you know, we were not private, and we started precisely because the Portuguese government realized we need to internationalize these startups fast. Who, which one of the ecosystem is, you know, an example, Boston, and so this partnership that the Portuguese government, actually the Ministry of uh, uh, Science, Technology, and Higher Education, did with MIT, which was called BGI at the beginning, was the, was the MIT Portugal Entrepreneurship and Innovation Initiative, and our slogan was Building Global Innovators, <laughs> that then became our name. It started precisely because uh, we we realized this. We we need to learn from the others, and and we need to sell. And I think that's uh, one of the major advice we have from the top 25 startups that we always ask them: What would be the advice you would give to the other startups? Like, look immediately outside. Yeah. Do pilots in Portugal? Portugal is great for pilots. Look outside. Look outside for investment. Look outside for clients, because if you want to scale and become a unicorn you won't make it here. And it's true. And so I think that that's also very, it's something that the Portuguese know. And by the way, it's okay. You know, back in the time we used to have half of the world and now we are this small. So we are used to go outside and, and try to find our way in. So I think that's just in our culture as well. I, just, I, just, I have to sit there and say really quickly, it's funny where we use that whole entire risk versus risk avert. You cannot be in this ecosystem without enjoying and embracing risk. I mean, it's what we do. We crave it. I mean, we really crave it. And so anyone that's listening has to understand if you're choosing to not have a regular job, you're choosing this world, that means you want the risk and you should actually take more risk. So stretching yourself out and going to other countries, if you're going to be in this ecosystem is super important for learning, if nothing else, for learning. Your company may fail. You as the individual that's doing it is not the failure. The company may fail, but it, it prepares you for the next thing that you're going to do. So take as many risks as possible. And for the investors, that risk is being a risk averse. Yes, I understand as a venture capitalist, you're in charge of other people's money. But honest to goodness, they're in it with you because they want the risk as well. Yes. So I, I, would, I would have to, because we're running out of time. So I think we have some comments on YouTube, which we can, I think we can take one or two then we'll have to begin to round up the, the webinar. So I think there's an interesting one. I think this also might be also be interesting for Rodrigo as well. It was talking about how the number of startups in the USA has been booming with pandemics, with the pandemics, but not in Portugal. Um, that did anybody, maybe even Portugal Ventures or Informa DP from looking at data, or even, did any of you anticipate um, a situation in the ecosystem? Could you anticipate this? And is there any chance of anticipating this in the future or this kind of thing happening again? Um, this one, my YouTube. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent the end of the question, but I think what we can say is that what what we've been feeling uh, with our with our with our with our invested companies is um, it's very very different impacts, right? So we do have we have companies that are prospering a lot uh, from the pandemic, um, and we are, have companies that are suffering a lot with the pandemic. Um, I think well, obviously we, as, as everybody, as everybody, as everybody, at least the Portuguese uh, within the ecosystems might know, um, we have a very different and very, very diverse portfolio, uh, right? And and mostly our mostly our what we what also we've been trying to do to do to do this year in, in this very tough year is naturally um, support our companies. Um, to to make them be able to to get through the to get through the crisis and obviously the ones that the ones that are there are there are there are growing to be able to grow even faster. Um, so we, we we have been we have been we have been trying uh, to 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 address them 
uh, within our portfolio companies and also uh, outside of our, of our portfolio companies. And when we did have a, spe a special program for that as well. Um, uh, but obviously, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's something that that none of us was was expecting, right? Uh, and and naturally, it will have its it, it will have its impact. Um, but we also see here a lot of companies that are that are making great. We also have here uh, a YouTube question. It's not well. It's not uh, only about governmental funding, even liberal countries have to create conditions to encourage private investment in this ecosystem. Tesla received 0.4 billion of federal loans, China support uh, Huawei, UK has favorable tax conditions. Um, this is really not a question, I think it's more of a comment. And then there's also a comment saying that Farfetch is not a Portuguese company, which is correct. Uh, we don't count Farfetch as a Portuguese company, uh, it's a UK company. But it, but I think, but it goes into into the into the numbers of companies that that have gotten um, also at some point out of Portugal or have come to contribute to the Portuguese ecosystem as well. Um, yeah. I think that they did something that most startups do, which is keep their uh, development team in yeah. Portugal and have their huge offices with very talented people at a much better price than have it in the UK, even if your headquarter is in UK. We do yeah. have a lot of, like Feedzai, their headquarters are in US, Talkdesk, their headquarters are in US. Of course, they move. They, won't, they wouldn't stay in Portugal, especially if, if you want investment from UK or from US. They want your headquarter to be there which doesn't mean that you didn't start with a co-founder that was Portuguese. And so that's why it's also important for the ecosystem because these co-founders will be probably supporting funds in the future or even investment in Portugal. And that is really the key. I think that's, that's where we are starting to become closer to Boston ecosystem. When you have people that connect with people that connect with people and then transfer these. Um, every time we go to Venture Cafe, all entrepreneurs are amazed with how many people actually connect with you, have experience, share contacts. We still need that uh, a lot in Portugal. I think that the way forward is that. Of course, government's super important. We really, really, really need to uh, have more experience and that will of course shorten our error uh, trials, uh, error and, uh, and success trials. Yeah. And, and, and to Jody's point before, it, in, in the end, it's also a matter of uh, how willing you are to invest in, 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 different, in different businesses. And that's something that I think it's, 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 getting, it's getting better and it's changing, but traditionally um, US or UK, your UK investors invest uh, in US or UK companies. Um, it's, getting, it's getting much better, right? I think we are all more looking outside our, our, our borders uh, and 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 looking and looking to startups from from other countries uh, as well and nationalities start not to play that much of a role, um, but the, traditionally they did, right? So if you wanted to prosper uh, in the British market or in the U.S. market, you you traditionally had to move there. Yes, so uh, I think we have to start to round up right now. Uh, I could tell everybody, the panel speakers are already getting in the mood to have a conversation. So glad I put everybody in the same email. <laughs> so you can, all, you can all connect with it and continue these conversations have, um, moving on. So we, we, we intend to, we hopefully we feel like this is some of the kind of things we will have to do more, much more frequently as we all move into the virtual mode and to have these kind of conversations. Um, we've had quite an engagement with the audience on YouTube. Um, this would be, you can also go back and watch yourself again. Um, so um, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who was here on the panel session. Thank you for Fabio uh, for uh, allowing us to do this. Thank you to Thomas. Um, we, we are really happy about your new journey. We intend to continue to collaborate with you <laughs> as we move on as well. I want to say a big thank you to Jody. I know it's quite, it was quite early in the morning, but you're an <laughs> early riser. So thank you so much for, um, for being present here. I also want to thank, say thank you to Rodrigo. Uh, one of the things that um, we really value a lot about the report is the data that we get in from Informa and DMB. So it's really, really hard to get some of that kind of data because many of the entrepreneurs will not be 
open and honest enough to give us that information, but we're able to get that information directly from the source. So thank you, Rodrigo, for also being here on the panel. You're welcome. Also, Congrats. Thank you to um, Antonio. Um, um, it was a bit short notice, but Antonio always came to the to the rescue, <laughs> come to help us on the panel, and then hopefully we keep on to collaborate with you. And obviously also Sophia. Thank you. Uh, amazing Sophia for always being um, cheering out and uh, moving, helping to coordinate everything in BGI, and um, also um, Car um, Carol, who is in, who is absent at the moment, um, but she will see this. And uh, so, thank you, Carol, if you're watching this. <laughs> so, um, so for everybody to know, you can go and download the report. You know, you can go to www.scaleupportugal.tech. Um, we, uh, we, we, we pride ourselves in the fact that we always take a lot of feedback. So if you can give us on any feedback on how we can improve the report and what you think we can add, um, please let us know. We will continually update this report um, and obviously put new versions of the report on the, on the website. And um, um, yes, so I will say this brings us to the official end <laughs> of this webinar. Thanks to everyone who participated. Thanks to uh, my, uh, my assistant, Rihanna, who has been posting the questions here as well? She's been just hitting her face, but um, thank you, Rihanna, for the for the assistance. And um, thank you. I don't know if Sophia or anybody has anything, any last comments. To no, me. I just I just uh, hope that Jody continues to uh, support our startups. Antonio continues to invest on them, and of course, uh, Rodrigo continues to give us information for our reports. <laughs> And, and we hope Fabio keeps on um, supporting as well. Yeah, we are the partners. We'll be together. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. This is great. Thank you for doing this. This has been fantastic. I definitely want more of this as people that are wanting to engage more with the, the Portuguese community. Do more of this. This is amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks thank so you much. a lot. I agree. Thank you so much. So, um, so that's a good indication for us to have another one sometime soon. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, so um, this brings us to the end. Thank you to everyone who participated, everyone who joined on YouTube. Thank you for the questions. You can reach out to us um, on, our, on our social media platforms. We will be very, very responsive. If there's anybody that has spoken here that you want to reach or you want to talk with personally, please reach out to us and we'll try and make a connection uh, with them. You can also search them. They're all on LinkedIn. So you can always send them a connection request um, so you can have a better um, um, conversations with them. Thank you so much. And um, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.